Claire, it's a pleasure to have you back on the show. Um, welcome to another episode of Out of the Blank. I wanted to talk to you about your book, uh, Curse of Riches, which we never got into um, in our last discussion because we were talking a lot about Walter Friedman, the ice pick lobotomy, and things of that sort. But how have you been? I, it's nice to see you again. It's good to see you again. I'm very well. Yeah, I had a great summer. And uh... did you did you go to that Banksy exhibit? I'm very curious what that Banksy exhibit was like. Yeah, I was there yesterday. It was fabulous. Really, really good. And just a really interesting crowd. You know, not your normal art gallery crowd at all. Lots of kids and young people and just a fantastic atmosphere. You couldn't take pictures, which was another really cool thing they did. So people were really taking the time to look at the exhibits. Uh, And it was lots of his stencils and just was done in a really kind of tongue in cheek, funny way. Um, And just really cleverly done. And they had... uh, attendants there walking around with Polaroid cameras so you could ask them to take a picture of you by one of the the exhibits which was really cool so yeah it was was a really great exhibition I wouldn't say I'm sure it's going to make its way over to America so I I imagine you'll get a chance to see it. Part of my ADHD and kind of bouncing around on different hobbies is I watch a lot of Bob Ross and it seems kind of counter which is like ADHD you want to kind of keep moving and doing something active which is really good for it but for me slowing down at some points it's difficult which is why I like doing it but I got really into acrylic paintings and right now I'm trying to do like a birthday gift for a friend so it's a giant like I've never really attempted anything that's above like a small little canvas but it's this huge thing where I was like I'm probably going to have the energy and patience for one go at this no matter the size of the canvas so I need to go all out on this Italian landscape that I've never seen or never even bothered doing before, but I just saw a picture of it. I was like, I think I got, I think I got this in the bag. So, so, so it's interesting that you like art because it's a little bit for me too. I, I guess I got more appreciative of it as I got older. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm interested in kind of all the art. So you know, really like music, uh, contemporary music, classical, jazz, books of all sorts, movies, theater, art. Yeah interested in the whole lot so yeah like you and my brain tends to just jump around I like to I'm interested in all kinds of things and always want to know how things work so now we you came on to talk about curse of riches um with your book the Wendells how'd you come across this family I've never heard of them before I I maybe it's because I'm not from New York I never bothered looking into some of the history of New York but there's surprisingly a very big family when it comes to like at least their name going through history so yeah I am I was on deadline writing a magazine article and uh, I got distracted and kind of started just surfing the web and avoiding work. Um, And I don't know why, but for some reason I put world's richest pet into the internet. Um, And it came up with this story from a a British newspaper about Toby, who was a white Maltese poodle, who had uh, inherited a a fortune from his mistress, Ella Wendell. Um, and so I just became intrigued who was Ella Wendell, who were the Wendells. Um, and I discovered that they were a family who, who had come to New York from, from Germany, the first generation of the family um, in the, the late 19th century. And that they had become this incredibly famous, powerful family in New York uh, around the time of the Gilded Age. They built up a huge property empire, owned 150 pieces of land and property across Manhattan uh, and more in in Boston and other parts of New York and New Jersey and elsewhere in the US. Um, So they have this huge real estate portfolio. They're good friends with the Astors, they're related to the Astors and also the Vanderbilts, the Stuyvesants, the Poopers, all these respected families. Um, But as the the, the 19th century comes to an end um, and it's the start of a new century, the Wendell family just kind of tear themselves apart with a a series of of high profile battles between the siblings. There are accusations of insanity and promiscuity and there's false imprisonment uh, and there are these legal battles over love and money. Um, And I became fascinated by them. And this became a a six year uh, journey for me uh, doing archival research to see what was happening behind the the door of the Wendell family home. They had a mansion on Fifth Avenue, uh, 442 Fifth Avenue, and their house would later be dubbed towards the end of their lives, the House of Mystery uh, by the press. Um, And what I found was a really fascinating and and dysfunctional family who were imprisoned in what could only be described as a gilded cage. And, you know, my book is 
is non-fiction. It's, it's all a true story. Everything in there happened. And I quote uh, at great length from primary and secondary sources. It's a tale that is stranger than any fiction with these really vivid characters. There were the last generation of the family, there were eight siblings, just one brother and seven sisters. And they're all, they have unimaginable wealth. They can do whatever they want. Uh, we see them uh, in their childhood and early adulthood, riding their carriage in Central Park, going to all the fashionable shops in New York. They're beautifully dressed. They go to fabulous parties at the homes of their wealthy friends. Um, but there's, they all end up really struggling to find happiness in the world. Uh, and there's also this incredible love story between the master, John, uh, the, the only son in the last generation, and one of the maids. Uh, and one reporter, I think, summed it up very well when he wrote in 1926, you would have to go back to the works of Dickens, Charles Dickens, to find a tale as curious and fascinating as that of this old mansion, the Wendell Mansion and its occupants. Um, and yeah, I just became completely fascinated. And for me, one of the major motivations in researching them was that, you know, I was intrigued. I had lived in New York for years and yet I'd never heard of the Wendells um, and asked friends in New York and, and neither had they. And I became really interested, this incredibly wealthy, successful, powerful family. How had they just disappeared? How had they been erased from history? Um, so I set about finding finding the answer to that question. Was there ever any notes to the family or any of their archive materials that sh maybe got insight of how they knew if New York was going to be the city that was going to expand? I mean, buying property, you can buy property anywhere, but New York is like prime real estate as we think of now. But I don't imagine that back then unless they got a tip that something was going – the city was just going to boom up. I mean the depression hit everybody. But it just seemed like that was just a risky buy to just invest a lot of your money into real estate. I mean, it paid off for them. But do you, do you know if they, any family members talked about any insight? They were in there on the ground. Uh, Grandfather Wendell was good friends with John Jacob Astor. I think the two men, uh, and they worked very closely together to begin with. They were very good friends. They had a family connection. Um, I think they were just in on the ground and could see New York taking off. You know, they were down working around southern Manhattan, uh, obviously, you know, the ports, people coming in, they were trading, they were selling, buying and selling furs, um, and they could just see that this it was right for investment. And obviously, over the years, there are different waves of immigrants coming in from different parts of the world. And New York is just, you know, if you look at the, the demographics and, the, you know, the figures, New York just grows and grows and grows and grows and grows. And there are periods where it's, it's a huge boom um, but just steadily it's growing from the very beginning. And I think just, you know, they were there, they could see it. Um, and the first few transactions were maybe, you know, let's just see how this goes. And then they proved it proved to be such a, a rewarding business model that they kept going. Um, so, yes, and I think, you know, the first two generations of, of Wendell men clearly had a really good feel for property. I think John, the Johnny Wendell, the, the one son in the last generation, had less of a feel for it, but by the time he took over, uh, there was such an enormous portfolio of property that you know he it was kind of hard for him to mess up. They operated by basic rules, which were you buy, you never sell the property. Once you buy it, you hold on to it. The tenant always pays for any improvements, so the Wendells were not upgrading their property. Often they just owned the land and let the tenant build on their land, and then when the lease expired, they inherited the land, you know, it became theirs. Um, and they never took out a mortgage. They paid for everything in cash. And this was a business model, and then this idea of Broadway moving 10 blocks north, you know, that New York is going to grow and grow, so you keep buying higher up the island. Uh, and so we see them buying in what's now you know, kind of the business district and the and lower Manhattan. Then they come up through what are now the Lower East Side, the East Village and West Village, up through the Meatpacking District. Uh, they then go up sort of around Union Square and then start moving up Broadway um, into kind of Midtown and slightly up on the kind of Upper West Side. Um, and they just, you know, their, their purchases go further north. Um, and just they bought an awful lot on Broadway. They obviously knew from very early on that this was, you know, a really important artery in New York. Um, and, you know, today nobody owns even a tiny fraction of the Wendell owns what they owned. You know, nobody could afford to buy 150 pieces of property and land today in New York. You know, their portfolio would be worth billions and billions of dollars. 
I think rent in New York right now is insane. It's like more than probably you could buy a whole street in my town for as much as you can pay for a month of rent in New York. But the last generation, who consists of the last generation? Was it just Johnny and his two sisters or? No, so there's Johnny and there's seven sisters. So Johnny and Johnny, once his dad dies, um, Johnny becomes a uh, head of the family. He becomes known as John. Uh, so he's actually he's actually called Johan uh, after his grandfather. Um, and the siblings, so there are in birth order, there's Johan, who becomes Johnny, who becomes John, uh, Gottlieb Wendell, that's his middle name. So he's born 1835. Next is a sister, Henrietta, who was Henry, who's born 1837. Then there's Mary Eliza Astor. She takes uh, the, the name of her uh, uh, relative there. She's born 1839. Then there's Rebecca, Becky. Uh, and they all have lots of names. So Rebecca is Rebecca, Antoinette, Jew, Wendell. Often they're taking relatives' names or close family friends. Then there's Augusta, Gussie. Then there's Josephine, Josie. Then Georgina, Georgie. And then Ella, Ella Virginia von Etzel Wendell, who's born 1853. Uh, and my, my story really focuses on Johnny, Becky, Georgie and Ella. Um, partly because they were the ones who seemed to lead the most interesting lives. It was incredibly rich source material for them all. Um, and they also corresponded a lot with each other. Um, and just to kind of give you a little pen portrait. So John, he goes off as was common with wealthy families. He, he studied um, in New York. He was at Columbia. He studied law. Um, and he went off to Germany, as many wealthy young men did. Um, and took classes there. He wanted to stay in Germany and he wanted to become a diplomat uh, to, to join the diplomatic service. So he's there for about a decade. His parents give him lots of money. He loves the freedom he has there. You know, he's come from America where he's in this well-off family. There are very, very strict societal expectations. Um, and, you know, everybody kind of knows what's happening, keeps a close eye on each other. Um, and he's expected to socialize with certain people or you know, to be seen out with certain young women from respectable young families. Where in Germany, he can do whatever he likes. And I mean, he's a real ladies' man. Um, he obviously has a string of, of female acquaintances in Germany who's free to, to see as he wishes uh, without the kind of close chaperoning, which would have been common in America at the time. Um, so he's a central figure. His parents eventually say, come on, Johnny, You've had your freedom for 10 years. You've got to come back now. You're the only son. You have to come back and help your dad and take over the family business and, and learn it from him. So he comes back in the 60s, uh, 1860s. Um, there's Becky. Now, Becky's a kind of slightly, a very capable woman. She eventually, after John dies, takes over the business. Um, she's very headstrong, very self-confident, very um, sure of her place in the world. She has a really difficult relationship with Georgie, who's the younger sister. Um, Georgie is the kind of black sheep of the family. She's very rebellious. She's my favorite of them all. Um, she's the kind of woman who, if she were born today, would, there would be nothing unusual about her, but because she was born, you know, 150 more years ago, um, 173 years ago, she, uh, she's just seen as this really odd kind of woman. She's a vegetarian at a time when nobody's vegetarian. She's really into healthy eating. She goes to this one store in New York to buy wholemeal bread. Um, she, you know, she takes, she does all sorts of exercise regimes and fads. She takes the water cure, which was very popular um, in Europe at the time and becoming so in America, where she would take hot baths, cold baths, uh, baths where she was partially clothed. She would go outside walking with bare feet. Um, she rode a bicycle at the time. It was considered shocking for a, a woman from the upper classes to ride a bicycle. Did nobody in the family who was dealing with constipation bother to message Georgie and be like, hey, you got any health tips here? <laughs> well, exactly. She was she was the one actually telling them. She consulted doctors and was saying, you know, you've got to eat prunes. You've got to have more fiber. So, yeah, she was definitely the woman to go to. And she just was this kind of force of nature. She loved to travel. Um, she traveled all over the world. She had lots of very good friends. She also scandalized her family by taking friends from what were thought to be the lower classes. So she was good friends with a number of the servants and their children. Um, she had friends who ran a shop at a time when that was just considered a terrible, you know, a shocking, scandalous thing for a lady of fortune to do. And so she really becomes, in John's eyes, a problem. You know, he feels that she's out of control. She's rebellious. She likes to drink and 
was known to get drunk again at a time when this was considered shocking for a woman to do. Um, and she kind of delights in the fact that her family disapproves. So if anything, this kind of makes her inclined to exaggerate these aspects of her personality. Um, and then there's Ella, who's so Georgie is the second youngest. Ella's the youngest. Um, and Ella's kind of, she's a wee bit shrew-like and she's slightly martyrish. Uh, she has no real concept of just how rich they are. Um, she doesn't really care. She just wants to lead a quiet life. Uh, and she loves to spend time in their country house at Irvington. She just loves to be with animals and in peace. She doesn't really like New York. She finds it too busy and noisy and dirty and smelly. Um, and she and Georgie are great friends to begin with. They're educated together. The girls are mostly educated at home uh, by a tutor. And so Ellie and Ella and Georgie are often uh, in the schoolroom together. And they start out great friends, but as they become adults uh, and Georgie is seen as being more and more problematic, the, their relationship goes, becomes strained. And Ella's the one, you know, my heart goes out to Ella because they all have romances and the family all kind of gang up on each other. They're afraid of the fortune being broken up. Um, and so they, if any one of them's got quite a serious romantic relationship, they're all, you know, really disapproving. I know, you know, are you sure he's not just after your money? You know, you can't trust these gold diggers. And this is an idea that came from their father, who was terrified, you know, when he would die, he had one son and seven daughters. He's terrified of fortune hunters who were a thing. You know, guys would come to New York and seek out women of fortune and, and prey on them. So the father had kind of put this idea into their head. So I think they're all afraid of fortune hunters, but particularly Johnny and his mom. Um, and so Ella's a real romantic and on the point of marrying several times. Uh, and, you know, we read her letter. She's so in love uh, with these young suitors of hers. Uh, and her family, particularly her brother and her mother, are just saying, you know, no, this cannot go ahead. You've got to call this relationship off. Um, and so we just see them, you know, they start out as this incredibly successful family. They, you know, they have their horse and carriage. They ride around Central Park. They have a lovely mansion on Fifth Avenue. The family are all beautifully dressed. They have power in the city. Um, you know, they really could have anything they want. But we see their lives, you know, none of them marry. So they get into this really odd situation where... For much of the year, they're all living together as adult children um, with, you know, initially their parents, their father dies. Um, and then it's, you know, the mother and all, all the children who are now adults at an age where the daughters, you know, society, society's rules dictate they should all be married. But instead, they're all living together and living with their mom in this really unnatural situation. And inevitably, that causes tension and, and difficulties within the family and bitterness. Would you think that with having all that money and that many family members that they would have turned out the way that they turned out? Like, I mean, are you surprised with the outcome of the family? Yeah. And, you know, just throughout, I was, you know, the things that made me really interested in them from the get go um, were, you know, why were they not more famous? Why had they just disappeared? And also, um, you know, they could have had anything they wanted, but why Why didn't they? And why did they cling so hard to each other and, and to their fortune? Um, you know, you just think they're not the first wealthy and dysfunctional family, but there seemed to be something so extreme and so acute about the extent to which they went to protect their, their family and their fortune. And I just kind of find that fascinating. And I was really surprised by what I discovered that, you know, it just seemed to be this compulsion to not let anyone break them up that was what led to their demise. And, and for me, that was really interesting. Another thing I found fascinating was that, you know, I think it was their intention that they would disappear without trace. So they'd leave an enormous fortune. Um, it was valued at around $100 million uh, when Ella died in 1931, but this was during the Depression, so it was probably worth considerably more of that. And in terms of the real estate they owned, it would have been worth an awful lot more than that. Um, they leave most of it to charity, so most of it goes to uh, hospitals, to religious charities, to churches, to missionaries overseas, um, to animal charities, to, you know, charity for the, the blind, for um, orphan children. And yet, you know, at the time, it was really common for families to demand naming rights. So they also leave a large amount of money to Drew University in New Jersey. So to demand that the university is renamed the Wendell University or that, you know, a department or a wing is renamed after them or, 
you know, that a hospital names a wing after them. Um, but they didn't um, demand any of those things. You know, it was almost as though they disappeared by design. They just wanted to give their money away. And then you think, well, why did they hold on to it so tightly if, if it was just going to be given away? You know, what, there were no descendants to give it to. Um, so that was, for me, was really interesting, especially, you know, we live in an age now where it seems so many people want to be famous and want to earn a fortune. That I kind of found their attitude to fame and to money and to their fortune really interesting. It was so perverse in many ways. And, you know, they were kind of the anti-Kardashians of their day. They, uh, you know, their their peers, like the Rockefellers, you know, the Astors, Carnegie's, the stuff, all these people really loved to be in the limelight. And they threw these really extravagant parties and had enormous yachts and, you know, rebuilt these really extravagant, luxurious houses and, you know, had palaces and chateaus. And the Wendell's house, it was fashionable when it was built, but they just kind of then left it. You know, it was they had the same house for for decades and they never saw the point in mod modernizing it. They didn't bother to add a ballroom. Um, you know, they didn't really care what other people thought of them. And I think that's really fascinating. I think that's really admirable in many ways. You know, they kind of they just lived life in a very quiet way. You know, they'd come from very humble beginnings. And it was almost as though they continued to live in a for the most part, a really quite a humble way, despite their huge fortune. And, you know, that seems so kind of perverse and out of step with what other families of, of wealth were doing that I was just kind of fascinated by that. Were they more considered about the wealth, like all the members of the family, more caring about the wealth um, and what other members would lead it to? Like if it was going to get caught in the hands of maybe a bad relationship or something like that, or someone was going to blow it all, or were some of them caring about the actual family relationship and trying to keep everybody together? I would have to think your family, and look, I get money can be corrupting, but at some points, someone in that family out of the seven or whoever has to at least think about like, hey... How about we actually worry about caring about each other a little bit too, especially in the end, if they don't, I mean, if they give it all away, you'd have to think though, you're so spent most of your life or all your life caring about keeping the money safe that eventually towards the end, you're kind of just like, does it matter in the first place? Yeah, I know. And you know, I think it's very noticeable that, so the parents obviously really cared um, and they really kind of hold the family together. They're like the rocks. Um, and I think things start to slightly unravel when the dad dies, Pa Wendell, when he dies um, in the 1870s. It was like he was the kind of guiding force and he was, you know, principled and good and honourable and kind. And um, I think they all really looked up to him and they all cared about his opinion. And, and you know, everybody got along with each other. You can see things start to get more strained after his death. The other thing that happens is the same year, several months before the, fa the father dies, before John Wendell Sr. dies, uh, the, his daughter, his eldest daughter, Henrietta, also died. She died of diphtheria. Um, and the family are really very, tra they're, they're traumatized that, you know, one of the sisters and the dad die within, you know, just months of each other. And I don't think they ever really recover from the shock of that. Uh, one of the sisters, Augusta, um, has a breakdown and John Wendell, the son, insists that she goes off to an asylum. Um, and his his treatment is, you know, really callous. Not, I don't think it would be exceptional at the time if, you know, you have someone who has a breakdown, you just send them away and forget about them, which is what he did. Uh, we certainly see Georgie cares and Georgie goes to visit her sister and really lobbies her brother and her mum, you know, bring Gussie home. It's not right that she should be in this place. She should be cared for at home by her family. Um, and I think, you know, they all in their own way do care. I think Mary cares. I think Becky cares. I think John seems to care more about what people think and if there are going to be rumours about them. Um, Ella cares. I think just they get worn down over time. Um, and their battles with each other become so intense. Uh, John is also really controlling of their access to their inheritance. Uh, he insists that he'll keep an eye on all the property. Um, and so that's also really difficult. Georgie likes to spend money. She's the, the one amongst them, actually, that and, and John, to an extent, John the son, um, both spend uh, reasonably uh, well compared to the others. Um, and John obviously really resents when his sisters spend money. I think he really resents. He feels he's been summoned back to America to take the family business on and to earn money and be successful. And he really resents that his sisters 
A, have what he sees as freedom, for all arguably women at that time really did not have much freedom. Uh, and he also resents them, you know, kind of frittering away the money as he sees it. And so this causes all kinds of tension. Um, and I think because they're such a big family, it's kind of interesting just to see the dynamic with that and to see, you know, they all form alliances and allegiances and, you know, one's friends with the other and supports them. But then there are these these alliances change and shift over time in a way that's really interesting. Um, and what in Georgia is maybe seen as kind of high spirits when she's a child is seen increasingly by them as problematic and something that could get them into trouble. Um, and so to cut a long story short, John then decides that he's going to have Georgie also sent to an asylum because he wants her locked up because he's worried that she's going to cause a scandal for the family. And so easier just to, to bribe someone to say that she's insane and have her locked away than to actually have to deal with her. Um, and so, you know, I think this family is exceptional for many reasons. And, and a key one in that is, is how John treats his sister and how he tries to police them. Why didn't John just go back to Germany or leave once, you know, he, I mean, he got seven other family or six other family members to be able to have them run the business. And I get yeah, it. Yeah. I think that was, I think that, you know, I think that was a major trauma in their family. You know, I think had John been able to let somebody else do it or had he had others to share the burden with, things would have worked out much better for them all. It was simply that idea at the time that, you know, he was the only son. And it was, you know, I think uh, the father certainly regarded uh, Becky as someone who could have run the business. Georgie, from a young age, took a really big interest in the business. I think they could both have done great things for their dad's business, but they were women. Um, and so that would have just been seen as, you know, that couldn't be done. Women couldn't run the business. So only when John dies, when the only brother dies, um, do the sisters get involved? Um, and, you know, I think that caused tension because I think um, certainly Becky and Georgie and probably some of the others would have liked to have been involved. I think had John been allowed to stay um, in Germany and do his own thing, they would all have been much, much happier. What did they have in the German archives? I'm guessing a lot of it's messages to John and maybe some messages going back out that was left there in the archives. I mean, when yeah, you mentioned- and there was all, So there was also, um, you know, there was lots of documents about the history of the family and their, you know, the, the, their family tree, um, university records for the institutions where he had studied. And um, there were also their, so their fur business um, there was obviously trade between America and Germany. So over the generations, there was paperwork connected with that, much of it in German, some had been translated. There's also, it's a kind of story of two parts because part A is the story of the rise of the Wendell family and what becomes of them, how they build up their fortune and then how they protect, try to protect it and you know then tear themselves apart. The second part of the story is about how after the family's all dead, Ella dies in 1931, She's the last of the siblings to die, the last Wendell to die, or so we think, because I also discovered that John actually had a, a secret love child um, that nobody knew about. Um, so that's a whole other story too. But the second story is about the battle over their estate. So the Wendell family lawyer, who is a book in himself because he's really corrupt and you know kind of sucks up to them to get their money, um, he makes this announcement that there were no heirs. Um, and so it's the depression. All of these people from all over the world come out of the woodwork and say, oh, you know, I was related to the Wendells or, you know, my middle name is Wendell or, you know, my name is Vendel. Uh, you know, we were related or maybe we were related. And so all these people, 2000, more than 2000 people come forward to make a claim on the, the estate. Um, and it becomes this very long legal battle, which involves more than 100 lawyers and costs millions of dollars um, as they try to unravel this and find out actually who were the heirs. Um, so that in itself is a really interesting story. And so the, the archives in Germany, there was also a lot of you know, many in, in certain towns in Germany, uh, people in villages and towns would club together to make a claim on the estate. Some of them even took a, a ship to, to America to present themselves to the Wendell lawyers to say, oh, look, here's our case. Um, and so the story over the estate is also really fascinating, all these people. And then obviously the people who were named in the will, like Drew University, um, like various charities, uh, hospitals, um, they are then obviously trying to fight off all these claimants, most of whom are just false claimants. 
uh, who are trying to get money. And then there are a few uh, distant relatives who, who are given relatively small sums of money. Um, and then this one uh, descendant of John's who I discovered, who, because he was illegitimate, couldn't have inherited the entire estate, uh, but would certainly have been, uh, could have taken a very large sum of money. How did you come across? Is it like, was he on Facebook or something like that? Or you yeah, so this is a really strange, this is, I mean, this is such a great story and it's one of the, the most fascinating bits of the book to research. Um, so I discovered in amongst their papers, diaries of a, a young lady called Martha and Martha was a maid for the Wendell family. Um, and at first I couldn't work out who she was talking about. She was talking about someone who she was obviously having an intimate relationship with. Um, and then she she mentioned that he was called John. And I thought, hmm, you know, was she having a relationship with John Wendell? Obviously, it wasn't unheard of for maids and servants to be taken as lovers by their rich male employers. So sure enough, Martha had been in a relationship with John Wendell, John the son, um, which had lasted for decades um, and had several times or a number of times uh, fallen pregnant with John's child. Uh, he would then arrange for her to have abortions. Um, and on one occasion, she keeps the child. Um, and so John makes arrangements. He stays in touch with them and he continues to send her money. Uh, but he also finds somebody to act as the, the child, his child's father, to kind of protect them from, from the shame that uh, they would have had if the child had been born without a father. Did you get so? Did you get? Is this the son? Is he? I'm guessing he's dead, or she? Yeah. Dead. So, so basically, this the son is was called Henry. Um. So I did lots of research. Um, lots of online research. I also had a a professional genealogist who I've worked with in the past, who's just fantastic at tracking people down. So she she and I between us uh, came up with a list of of uh, people. Henry Hall Weddell was their surname. Uh, or Hall Waddell, I think would be the American pronunciation. Um, and so basically I had a whole list of them and so just phoned through them. I could tell from Martha's diary and from letters, um, I was able to kind of narrow it down to a few locations across America that I thought it was likely to be. Uh, and so eventually I got to the one that I figured it must be through you know speaking to all the others and crossing them off the list. So I wrote to this part, I, I, phoned the number I had for this Henry Hall Adel, uh, there was no answer. So I wrote him a letter, an old fashioned paper and pen letter uh, and posted it just saying that I was doing research on this very famous family, the Wendells. Um, and I had reason to believe that he, his family were very closely connected to them, uh, that his grandmother had had a very close connection to them and wondered if he would uh, be happy to talk with me and basically I didn't hear anything and I wrote again I phoned a number of times never got through um, and then years later uh, I, out of the blue I woke up to an email with his the Henry Hallwedell as the subject line uh, and this was from a friend of the Hallwedells who was going through Henry's papers Henry had died just the week before um, Damn. and he had been going through his papers um, and said, oh, you know, I just, I came across a letter that you'd written him years ago. I get the impression he never replied to you and I wonder if I can help. Um, so he and I arranged to talk on the phone. We had a, a great chat. Um, he was really, you know, he was completely flabbergasted to hear of this connection because Henry was a reasonably, you know, ordinary guy, a relatively well-off guy, but not really off the scale rich at all. You know, he had a nice car and a nice apartment, but he wasn't like mega rich. And he died in a relatively ordinary Florida retirement community. Um, and so we had this long chat and he said, well, you know, I have a box of, of his family papers, which, you know, there are no relatives to give them to. I was just going to throw them in the trash. Uh, do, you, do you want them? Can I mail them to you? And so he mailed them to me. Um, and it was just this incredible kind of treasure trove of, of papers. Um, so there were letters between Martha and John. There were more of her diaries. There were the actual deeds, the original deeds uh, for properties that John Wendell had bought for Martha. You know, he'd kind of put her up in a love nest before she fell pregnant and he would go to visit her there. Um, and they had this, you know, relationship. He would be intimate with her in this love nest that he bought her. And so the the deeds for this property 
um, and East 61st Street were in the box along with all kinds of other things. Um, so, you know, it was incredible and it was just, you know, such a, a chance thing. You know, he could very easily have just thrown all those papers out in the trash, but he happened to come across my letter. Henry had happened to save my letter. Um, and so, you know, Henry died without knowing he had this connection to the Wendell family. Uh, his father had known about it, though he'd found out very late that his father was this rich millionaire and not the man who had posed as his father. Um, bec- when the, the estate battle was on over the Wendell money, his mother had actually said to him, she kind of push, felt pushed to tell him who his real dad was. Um, so there's this you know, fascinating story. And yes, it wasn't unusual for wealthy men to have relationships with their maids, but this was a relationship, it was a real love affair. You know, it wasn't just sex. It was a love affair that lasted more than 30 years. John didn't always treat Martha well, but he was undoubtedly in love with her and she was certainly in love with him. And I think just the richness of the materials that survived, you know, diaries and letters and all kinds of other things, make this, you know, quite an extraordinary story to have access to. You know, it was almost like having a ringside seat in their relationship. It's crazy those connections that come together. I mean, you stumbled upon a crazy connection or just a happenstance of these things falling into your lap as well. So it's like digging through my grandmom's um, stuff in our garage. I didn't know she almost married a JFK secret service agent. And I'm like, I'm so into the JFK stuff. I was like, dang, like if I would have known this years ago, I would have asked you all about this. So now I'm just going through like documents and letters back and forth, which to me just enriches the history a little bit. But do you think that it's weird that Henry didn't have kids? Um. So... Yeah, so so Henry, so Martha's son Henry, the first Henry, um, he obviously had, he had one son. His son had a childhood illness, which led to him um, having various difficulties. Uh, he never married. He had a close relationship with his mom. I get the impression his parents were very overprotective of him uh, in a way that you could argue the Wendells were too. Um, I don't really know. I'm really sorry I didn't get the chance to talk to him. You know, there's always pieces of your puzzles that remain just out of grasp. I'm really sorry that I didn't get to talk to him. Um, no, you did, you've done a lot of work. I mean, this is, I mean. You, yeah, you, no, absolutely. And, you know, I feel like I really had a good picture of of that relationship and that part of the story. I, I also reached out, you know, it's amazing what you can do now with social media and Facebook and whatever. So I reached out to various people connected with the story of, descendants of people who had worked for the family or who had had friendships with them and you know it was interesting some you knew quite a lot Uh, there were other relatives of Martha's her she had quite a few siblings so I also contacted descendants of theirs Um, and there were you know they knew they were able to tell me things about Martha though um, nobody really knew about this relationship with John which was so interesting Um, and just yeah they were just a family who or interesting for for so many reasons. Um, and I can't help but, you know, you think back to, to John when he was in Germany and he was this incredibly talented, amusing guy who was fluent in many languages, obviously smart, he likes adventures. Um, and it just, you know, he, he starts off as this guy who had everything going for him um, and then becomes this really unhappy, tyrannical figure. And it's just interesting through reading all these letters and, you know, letters with his sisters, letters with people outside the family, exchanges between him and his mom, looking at his diaries, his business ledgers, his letters to Martha. You just kind of see the erosion of of all that kind of optimism and, and hope and promise in his early life in a way that I just, you know, I ended up just feeling really sad for them. You know, you could say, oh, well, they were rich and they were just dysfunctional and you know they brought it upon themselves but you know they had so much money they really could have had anything they wanted and done anything they wanted and yet they did very little and it brought them no happiness whatsoever and I think you know for me the more I got to know them I felt incredibly sorry for them you know I really did feel tremendous empathy for them and you know they would have been better off just living a really modest life and not having all this money. It seems like the riches were more of a burden than they were an actual gift. You know, once you start, kind of, I mean, the, the, the title of your book is perfect for this because you can really look at how a money can really bring a family down in this kind of spiral. It seems a lot like a drama like the Kardashians a little bit, except without all the money spending. Uh, but also the fact, I mean, 
I don't know. See, richness, you, you can base it in money. Money could buy you a lot of things. But I mean, without the family aspect, it seemed like they all really cared about each other, but only in the sense that they were trying to protect what a mistake another person might make, you know? Yeah. And I think, you know, you, when you see there's a point at which Ella and Georgie go off to Europe together and have this long trip. Um, and, you know, they're just sisters, young women. Off, They obviously have to have chaperones and, and family friends go with them because they're young women. They can't travel on their own. Um, but they're just, you know, young women of means who, you know, they were very lucky to be able to have a trip like that. Most young American women at the time couldn't have afforded to. Um, they're just sisters having a good time. And, you know, you kind of see between their letters, they write to the other sisters at home and they write to, to their mom and they're just exchanging jokes and stories and news. And it seems very ordinary. But then, you know, there's just this dark force over it of John keeping an eye on how much they're spending. And, you know, he disappears out of town because he doesn't want to give them the money they need for the trip just before they're due to go. And that casts this really dark shadow, I think, over all of their relationships. You know, they can't just be themselves and just enjoy their lives. They're always being watched. And I think his kind of surveillance of them and of their spending it's kind of contagious, you know, it's almost they, they all just start to to police each other and disapprove of each other. And it's just like, you know, the rot sets in. Do you think John would understand? I mean, Georgie's rebelliousness. I mean, John wanted to go to Germany and he lived there for 10 years and probably it seems like he didn't really want to leave. So then you have Georgie that has more of a rebellious side, whether it's maybe a different side of being rebellious or just disconnecting from the family. But you think he would understand that? I mean, did Georgie and... I'm going to blank on the other ones. I got sent to the asylum. Did they die there? Yeah, so so both, both uh, Gussie and Georgie die in asylums. Um, and as I say, Georgie would go and visit Gussie regularly. Um, she took much more of an interest and was obviously more troubled than anyone else by her sister being uh, sent there. Georgie herself ends up in an asylum and nobody really visits her. So they both die in asylums with, you know, paid companions or uh, and, and friends are the only ones. Georgie has this incredibly, you know, she's the classic example of someone who feels like her family's let her down and her friends become her family. And so she she has these very good friends and very loyal friends who really rally for her. She ends up when George, when John's trying to have her locked up and committed to the asylum, it, there's this back and forth because he just has her illegally declared insane and locked up and then her friends get it brought to court and it's thrown out and she's a, she's set free and then John catches her again and there's this awful bit in the book um, where she's actually under house arrest by you know, her own family keeping her captive in their home in Irvington and um, this is where uh, you know, she spent many of her happiest years there. Her best friend is the family's gardener from Irvington's daughter. Um, and now she's being held captive in an attic room there. Um, and there are guards hired to keep an eye on her and, and nurses and, and doctors come in and give her morphine and strychnine just to kind of oh subdue her so that they can manage her. And she understandably, you know, shouts and screams and calls them all kinds of names. Um, and so, you know, it's just horrific, the idea that you would do this to your sibling. Um, and I think, you know, I think you're getting to the heart of it there. Is, you know, you would think John and Georgie actually had a lot more in common than I think either of them would ever have admitted. You know, they're both, they want freedom. They want to be able to go and be separate from their families. They both love to travel. They both have a taste for, you know, nice food and nice wine and nice clothes. Um they're both very sociable people, um, and yet they're each other's worst enemies. I think John was very, very jealous of Georgie and what he saw as, you know, maybe he saw her as having the life that he should have had, you know, the freedom to come and go as he pleased. Um, and she also, you know, she would just take up with you know, friends and also boyfriends um, of all kinds of backgrounds, which he thought was a scandal in a way that he had done and he had been able to do that secretly because he was in Germany and he was a young man and he was being left because men at that time were allowed to do that kind of thing. Um, so, you know, they could actually, if only they could have been each other's allies, things might have turned out very differently. Did John ever express any regrets for locking two of his sisters up? I mean, through a diary or letters or anything of that sort? 
No, he seems his major preoccupation, and he just doesn't seem to have been troubled too much by Gussie. I think he just told himself that, well, she needed to be there and that was the best place for her to be and, you know, she would get the best care there. With Georgie, his major concern was that she had the potential to embarrass him and, and bring shame on the family. Um, he does slightly strike a conciliatory note later on when he invites her to come back to live in the family mansion on Fifth Avenue. Um, whether you could say that he could, you know, it would acknowledge that he'd gone too far and that he, you know, he brings at one point, really brings her to the point of having a breakdown because he treats her so badly and so cruelly. Um, I, did he feel he'd gone too far and did he feel any remorse for that? I mean, you could debate that forever. Um, my own guess is that he, concerned, he was much more concerned with how it looked to other people and with, you know, them having a good name. But they become this, I kind of jump straight into the story and, you know, they, just to kind of set them up, they were this very wealthy, very respectable, very powerful family whose name was known, you know, they never courted attention, but they were, you know, really looked up to, certainly in the generation of their father's time. Um, you know, they were a very well-to-do, good, solid New York family um, of German immigrants. And, you know, they lived a good life. And by the end of it, because the last generation has fallen apart in this spectacular manner, obviously some of these stories did make it into the press. They become this curiosity. Their house becomes really old fashioned because John doesn't want to spend money doing it up and modernizing it. So it's kind of falls behind the times. Their rich friends move uptown because this bit of Fifth Avenue is now mostly department stores and offices. It's not residential anymore. So everybody else is moving up to be near Central Park where the air is fresh and the Wendells stay. They've become kind of the only holdouts. And so they become this curiosity. They become known latterly as the weird Wendells. And tour buses actually stop outside their house while the tour guides tell stories of the Wendells and this odd family. And Toby, who was kind of put me onto their story in the first place, they're at one point, you know, everybody wants to buy the land that their house is on. And they have this enormous yard, which is something of an oddity in that part of Fifth Avenue, which is just empty. You know, it's just paved. Um, and so lots of people want to buy it. At one point, Lord and Taylor, the famous New York department store, wants to buy the Wendell House and the land. And he, he says to all these people who want to buy it, oh, no, sorry, you can't have it. My sister needs it to exercise her dog. You know, that's the dog's playground. And so he's really being perverse. He, he likes to, you know, John is not all bitter and tyrannical and hateful. He he's actually can be very amusing and very charming. Uh, but it's hard for the negative to not overshadow that. But he likes to joke and he loves practical jokes. And this is him having a joke. You know, he's kind of poking fun at the press. Um, and, you know, that's not the reason he's keeping it. He's keeping it because he's contrary, but it's not really for the dog. And so the tour guides on these tour buses tell stories about the million dollar dog run. And, you know, this yard of the Wendells could have been sold for millions of dollars, but the Wendells kept it because they're so wealthy. They just kept it for, for the dog to, to use as a playground. Um, so they just become a real kind of oddity and curiosity in New York. And it's in such contrast to how they'd started out as this wealthy, respected, powerful family. Based on your work, do you think that the the riches were more of a concern or do you think that it was the the family name? that was more of a concern? I mean, do you think it based on each family member or do you think there was more of a mentality of keeping that Wendell name intact, Wendell's? Um, do you know, I think it was both things. And I think in a funny way, when I talk about keeping the, the Wendell fortune intact, it was probably more keeping their business intact. And I think for John, it was kind of as a tribute to his father and grandfather almost that he did not want to be the person who, you know, that it fell apart on his watch. You know, it was really important to him to keep together what his ancestors had created and to enhance it. And I think for him, it was more about that, actually, than it was about the money, more that the Wendell name, the Wendell business, the empire, all that they'd, you know, worked hard to build up over three generations, that it remained intact and that he did not let it be broken up. Um, and, it, you know, I find that really interesting because I don't actually think it was about the money so much. And I think the money clearly, you know, it did not bring them pleasure. But interestingly, even his father, and it was obviously his father had, 
um, giving them all the idea about these guys who might come into New York and you know woo the sisters and try and sweep them off their feet and steal their money. When Pa Wendell died, it was in his will that should his daughters marry, that if they had children, the property would go to the Wendell property that his daughters received from him on his death would go to their children and not their husbands. And this was quite new in York legislation that you were allowed to do this, that property wasn't automatically what's mine becomes my husband, you know, that the women could own property in their own right. And I think that's quite interesting. That's quite modern, because obviously he thought that the women deserved to have the property and that they could look after it. Um, so, you know, clearly, as a family, they were very concerned about maintaining. And this idea that, you know, you buy property and you never, ever sell it. I think there's something about the psychology of that's really interesting. This was obviously in the Wendell blood that this was, you know, you bought these things, you acquired property, you just didn't let it go. You had family, you have eight children, you don't let them go. I think, you know, there's a, there's something quite curious about that. And interestingly, um, Father Wendell, Pa Wendell, uh, John Daniel Wendell, uh, he had he had had two uh, siblings who had both died young. His wife had been uh, orphaned and had lost all her family and had been taken in by relatives. And, you know, you can only speculate. I find kind of mentions of it, but not enough to make a really kind of concrete conclusion. But you, you wonder, as immigrants who have lost and lost people they love, did that inform their desire to hold on to what came next? You know, I, we can't know. Um, but I think there's something really fascinating about the psychology of that where it's not just about being greedy for money. Is there something that left you with a question still at the end of all your work that you couldn't put in the book or anything, just one thing that you never got, I guess, an answer to, besides like the descendant and everything like that, but something about the family, whether it was a letter, or whether there was not a follow-up on something? Um, you know, I just, when you write books like this, and this is a kind of, I really love these, really deep archival research you know, books that require me to do years and years of archival research and just really burrowing into a story. The one thing that any writer of a book like this would love, you know, I would just so have loved to have spoken to one of them, you know, John, were you happy? You know, did behaving in this way make you happy? Georgie, you know, you were rebellious. It brought all sorts of trouble for you. Did you feel it was worth it? You know, did you got all these adventures and she travels all over Europe and she makes friends and has lovers? You know, did she really enjoy life up until the point, you know, the point where her brother tries to lock her up in an asylum? And clearly she never recovered from that. Just I would love to have just sat down with the Wendells and got a handle on this. But um, you know, you can never know it all, and that's kind of frustrating. Uh, but with the Wendells, they left such a rich archive. Uh, in various places around the world that you know there's so much information about them that I feel like I, I've got a very full picture of them but just nothing obviously would stand in for being able to actually quiz them I would have loved to have met Georgie and gone for a bike ride with her. Now is there any other materials out there like other other uh, reporters or anything like that have you come across anybody else's work on the Wendell's family like or is it's like you're just you kind of discovered this. I mean, it seemed like a spider web you kind of opened up. Yeah. No, and you know, it's interesting. I talked to a few people who'd worked as archivists in um, the, so the main collection of their, their family papers, which incidentally this is another really interesting thing. They never wanted their family papers to be saved, you know, and, and I, they would have liked them all just to be burned. Um, but because a number of them didn't leave wills and because there was this huge battle over their estate, all their papers were just kind of gathered up and taken off to Drew. Um, while the estate battle raged in case they were needed in the court case. And obviously they were needed. Um, and then they just stayed there. So, you know, the Wendells would have hated to think that someone had come along and written a book about them and told all their secrets, um, which in itself is kind of fascinating. Um, and also, I guess, you know, as a writer, is my conscience okay with that? Probably because there are no descendants to be upset about it. So I spoke to the archivists that Drew were fantastic. I also spoke to people who had worked it drew you know 10 years ago 20 years ago 30 years ago who had had dealings with the Wendell papers interestingly no one no researcher had ever come in to do research in those papers I guess just because the name had been forgotten um so there wasn't there hadn't really been any interest though one of the archivists said she had 
had a sabbatical and had uh, asked her boss if she could carry out her own research, just I think purely for her own interest in the Wendells. And so she'd spent time in their archive looking at their papers. She didn't produce any piece of work. She just you know, looked at them for her own interest. And she was saying she found it so depressing because their money had brought them so much unhappiness that she was just left with this overwhelming sense of sadness. Uh, I spoke to another archivist who said, she had just always thought she hadn't seen that much of their papers because I mean, there's like 65 boxes of their papers and they, have not, they haven't been catalogued. So it really is like looking for needles in haystacks. You've got to read like a huge big brown box and you maybe will find one document in it that's interesting and then you might go to another one and there are 10 or 20 documents that are interesting. Um, and she was saying that she just felt from what she'd seen of it, you know, there's a great book in here somewhere. And I just really hope that someone will write it one day. And she got in touch with me to say how much she'd enjoyed it because she just knew there was a book in there. And she just, you know, they were even more interesting than she thought they were from her experience of their papers. I guess it's surprising to me, like I said, about the lack, I guess, of the information out there. Well, when it comes to just people knowing about the family, I mean, I don't know if New York ever really talks about it or if it's something you just Google, like, I guess, top five richest families in New York or something like that. It might pop up there, but you'd think that would be like something that they, they would tell you about if you, I mean, you mentioned taking a tour. Was that just something you were just going around and someone had mentioned that there's this significant spot to it? Or is there something else? Like, I mean, does New York ever talk about, it? I know you're from there and you had to kind of look up or not from there, but you lived there for a brief amount of time. And then you kind of looked it up and found it. But like I said, when I looked when I was looking at your book, cause I remember last time you mentioned, uh, writing it and everything we were going to talk about it next time. When I looked up the Wendell family, I found a couple articles, but one of them was a presentation by you where I was like, is this like just a secret that just is, nobody wants to talk about or something? Well, we know about some older Rockefeller families and things of that sort of people with a lot of money that get mentioned a lot throughout history, but I never heard of this one. Yeah, you know, I think probably partly because they guarded their privacy so much. I mean, obviously they became very known around the time of uh, Georgie being uh, sent to the asylum and that she ends up obviously in a legal battle with her brother for her freedom. Um, but they, they didn't want to be remembered. You know, I think we would, in the same way that today, if you're in New York, there are buildings and streets and, you know, art gallery wings with, you know, Rockefeller, Carnegie, Astor, whatever. Um, they didn't want anything named after them. So that's one reason their name was forgotten. Um, and also, you know, I think when they die, then you get these really rich people. I mean, the people who came after, you know, the guys who made their fortune in the, the railroads and, and all these things, shipping, and um, their fortunes become so enormous that they really dwarf what the Wendells had. I mean, the Wendells at their time were very, very rich people. But then the kind of next generation of, of entrepreneurs and business people were, you know, times that by 10. Um, so, you know, their riches in the great history of, of America are, will no longer be in the top 10 or probably even the top 100 because people just got so rich. Um, but I think, you know, they, they own so much of New York that inevitably that made them very powerful. But, they, you know, they crop up in, I was amazed, like you say, when I was doing research, you know, you, you order up lots of history books of New York and, and books about New York property. And it was amazing just how little there was of them. You know, sometimes there might be a page or a couple of pages or, or mention of one or two properties. Um, so they, they cropped up like that, but there was really nothing very significant in books and in the kind of list, literature of, of that. Uh, and that, I think, you know, is partly by design. Um, because they didn't want to be remembered. And the tour buses you talk about, that was actually around the time, kind of the 1930s and after. So, you know, around the time um, of their death and, and the legal fight over their money uh, and in the last years of their lives. Um, but, you know, certainly in the last you know, 50, 60, 70 years, I think they had just been forgotten. I'm surprised the lawyer didn't try and find a way to get a piece of some of that estate or something. Well, like the that. lawyer, the lawyer gets lots of the estate. He really emerges as as the one of the villains in the story. Um, so he, John, and he have a falling out, and he tells his sisters that he doesn't want this lawyer Koss to have anything to do with the family. So he has a new lawyer. But then when he dies, the sisters don't really know what to do. And Koss had been the family lawyer. He'd been their father's lawyer, so he had worked for the family for since he was a, started out as a clerk, uh, as a very young man. 
Um, and so, you know, better the devil you know. So the sisters rehire Koss. Uh, they're not entirely sure of the falling out that Koss has had with their brother, but by this point, they don't really care. And, you know, they obviously had difficult relationships with the brother themselves. Um, and so Koss just sucks up to them. And Ella's the last one living. Ella doesn't really care about the money. Ella has no real sense of how much money they have. There's this very poignant letter where she describes sitting up mending horse blankets because, you know, she's got so much money, she could easily buy new horse blankets, but she make, make do and mend. You know, she's grown up with the kind of attitude that her grandmother and great grandmother have. So she sits up till like two o'clock in the morning sewing horse blankets and repairing bedding for herself rather than buying new ones. You know, she's just totally lost sight of the money. And Koss really sucks up to her. He also, his daughter um, also inherited a lot of money. So Koss and his daughter inherit a large amount of money. I mean, much, much more than Martha and her son got. Um, and they are really, in terms of individuals rather than institutions, they're really the big winners when it came to the Wendell fortune. Did he only really appreciate the father that he started out working for, or did he appreciate the family as much as he maybe might have showed respect to the father? Um, you know, I, I, I think he was probably opportunistic. Um, the father had taken a really paternal interest in him and had put him through law school in America, in New York. Um, and so Koss had really, and there's a letter where Ella, who's no fool, um, you know, towards the end, people try and portray Ella as being senile. Uh, you know, the people challenging the estate and they try and portray Koss, the lawyer, as having just totally taken control of her money, the Wendell money. And I think he probably did, but I don't think she was senile. I think she just didn't care anymore. She was an old lady. Um, and she wrote um, a letter in which she describes how the Wendell money has taken Cost the lawyer from a, a pretty humble start and has got him this, you know, fabulous uh, apartment uh, in um, the Upper West Side and a chauffeur driven car um, and fabulous holidays. And, and really, you know, he's rode on their coattails his whole career. The scandals emerge. That's what happens. The scandals <laughs> there are plenty emerge. scandals. Um, Claire, I appreciate the time you gave me to talk on my show. Is there a place where people can find um, your books, your new book as well, too? Um, and any other links you'd like to promote? Obviously, Instagram, Twitter. Yeah, so um, they are all on um, Amazon, obviously. You can buy the books um, on Amazon.com or Amazon, wherever you are. Also in local bookstores. Um, and The Curse of Riches at the moment is available through Audible. Um, it's a, an audiobook first, and there'll be a, a print version coming out later. Uh, and my website is clareprentice.org, so clareprentice.org, where you can also find links uh, and you know interviews I've done about various works. I've also got a series of talks coming up, uh, one of which is on the Wendell family uh, which I'm doing for the New York Adventure Club. So I'll, I'll post details about that on my website. Awesome. I'll link those in the description for people to be able to click. And thanks, everybody, for listening to this episode of Out of the Blank. Stay tuned for our next episode.